Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Clay Fink. And on today's show, I'm joined by Justin Hune. Justin, welcome to the show. Happy to be here, Clay. Thanks for having me. Now, I'm very excited to dive into today's topic, which is uranium. There's been a lot of buzz around the uranium markets as of late, and it's really piqued my interest. So I think the audience is going to really enjoy this conversation. Could you give an overview of the uranium market in general and why you're so optimistic on this space going forward, even after the significant run in price we've seen in uranium in 2021? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I guess 30,000 foot view. Uh, Uranium is a unique commodity that's the only fuel that is able to be used for nuclear energy um, currently. They're working on thorium reactors, and that's a potential for the future. But currently, the uh, north of 400 reactors that are operating globally that provide about 10% of global electricity and about 20% of electricity in the United States is nuclear energy, and it runs on uranium. Uranium is a commodity with a, uh, a long history of volatile price movements. It is a very, very slow commodity to, to react to supply and demand situations because of the difficulty for bringing new mines online, because of the, uh, uh, the regulatory issues that happen due to the, um, the radioactive nature of the, of the metal. It takes a very, very long time to explore, uh, discover, develop and produce uranium. And so when we have these cycles where you have uh, long periods of low prices, it takes a very long time to work through oversupplied markets. And when you have very high prices, it takes a very long time for the, for the market to react to those higher prices. You can't just bring production online like that to balance those price movements. So there's been multiple swings in, in, in the course of the history of nuclear and uranium mining where the price just goes on these extreme spikes and comes back down and stays way below the cost of production for years and years and years longer than anybody thinks it can. Uranium had a uh, very strong bull market from about 2003, uh, really from 2004 to about 2008, um, and where the price of uranium went from less than $10 a pound to $134 a pound. And the, the actual you know, marginal cost of production at that time was probably about $55 a pound. So it overshot significantly. Um, during that period of time, the equities for the publicly traded uranium mining companies went uh, on an absolute moonshot. You had companies go from pennies you know, up to $10. You had you know, Paladin go from literally at the bottom was about a penny and it went to $10. It's you know, uh, a 1,000x or 10,000%. Um, just huge, huge moves. There are a number of other companies, even the large caps returned, you know, 20, 25 X, which is absolutely monstrous. And, and a lot of investors made huge gains on that. So that really kind of, you know, the, the history of the investing potential for that commodity was what, what interested me at first. And um, from following the Fukushima nuclear disaster in Japan in March of 2011, uh, the market was in a, in a bear market for a very long period of time. Not only was it a, a negative hit to sentiment because of that, um, that, that event at Fukushima, but um, you also had a lot of reactors, all of the reactors in Japan, and about half of the reactors in Germany come offline over a relatively short period of time. And so you had about 10% of global demand just disappear. While supply, as I mentioned earlier, just continued to pump into the market, pump into the market. You had Kazakhstan, which was an up and coming producer at the time that was ramping production very fast, going from the, like the mid 2000s up until the mid 2000 teens, just growing exponentially. They were, it was a, a, a currency play because their, their, uh, their currency, the Tange, was pretty consistently being devalued against the US dollar. And so, and they were, they were 100% state run at the time. So they were just pumping it out, pumping it out um, and producing crazy amounts of uranium while the sector was mired in kind of this negative sentiment and demand coming offline after Fukushima. So long story short, that's, we had a brutal bear market. The equities got destroyed from that period of 2011 to about 2018 was when the commodity bottomed. Uh, excuse me, 2016, the commodity bottomed at $18 a pound. But the equities, you know, we went from, almost 500 companies in 2008 down to about 15 companies, maybe 20 companies, um, you know, in the, in the teens. And it started to ramp up from there. 
Now we have about 65 publicly traded companies and um, the sector is starting to rebound. And over that period of time that I've been watching the sector and interested in from an investing standpoint, there's been a lot of developments that are pro-nuclear in terms of nuclear energy being now uh, more and more classified as a green energy source. It uh, produces zero carbon in its electricity production. And as um, environmentalists become increasingly alarmed about carbon emissions, nuclear starts to look a lot better than it did in the past. And so um, we're seeing kind of the, the environmental left to be supportive of nuclear kind of for the first time really ever. We're seeing bipartisan support in the United States, which is something very unique that, you know, the, the Democrats and Republicans agree on almost nothing. Uh, we're seeing nuclear just now included in the EU taxonomy as a green energy source. Um, that's yet to be completely official, but it's likely to, to go through and be enacted starting next year. And so there's this um, growing positive sentiment around nuclear, and it is a growth industry. China is planning to build 150 new reactors in the next 14 years. Um, it's set to grow as an industry as a whole, two to three percent per year for the next you know couple of decades. So it's um, just this very interesting, unique sector that is an energy play. It's a commodities play. It's a green energy play. Um, it's something that you can invest in, feel good about from an environmental standpoint. And, uh, and the moves are very volatile in both directions. But when money comes into the space, as I mentioned, only 65 companies and still now it's barely a $40 billion industry as far as the publicly traded companies go. So when money really flows into the sector, the stocks move incredibly, incredibly hard to the upside. So that's kind of the, the long and short of it, really. You mentioned that China is planning on building 150 nuclear reactor plants. To give the audience some perspective, how many reactors are currently you know, running in the world today? And maybe go into how much the U.S. is investing in the space as well. Sure. Um, currently running in the world right now, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but it's something around 450 reactors currently running. And with China in particular, they have, I believe it's 51 gigawatts of nuclear currently, and their goal is 200 gigawatts uh, by 2035. So that would be about 150 reactors to, to meet that goal. Um, they currently have 18 reactors under construction right now, and they have uh, 50 something planned and a hundred and something uh, proposed. So it looks like they're, uh, they're shooting for that goal. And they're, as of now, they are definitely enacting uh, to meet that goal. Um, how much is the U.S. investing in nuclear? The U.S. seems to be more interested now in uh, what is referred to as advanced nuclear. So this is kind of like the next generation of nuclear energy. Uh, there are these nuclear reactors called small modular reactors or SMRs, and they are smaller. Um, they're modular and uh, they, they operate at a much lower capacity and uh, using a higher enriched fuel that is much more efficient and much safer. The, these are essentially meltdown proof reactor designs. And because of their size, they can be implemented into smaller electricity grids. They're not going to take 15 years and $20 billion to build. It'll be one or 2 billion and they can build them in two or three years and they can plug them into smaller grids. There's already one set to be built in the state of Wyoming in place of a former coal plant. So literally just kind of plugging into the existing grid where a coal plant used to be. And uh, one of the cool elements to some of these designs is that um, they are working in the ability to cycle up and down more easily. So this is one of the one of the drawbacks, I guess you could say, about these large nuclear reactors is they're slower to cycle up and down and they have limited capacity in that cycling, maybe 10% to the upside or the downside in terms of producing more energy or retracting a bit. Um, so it's more difficult for nuclear to uh, coexist with renewables. So you have renewables. So solar during the day is producing a ton of electricity and at night produces zero. So you have to have, without storage capacity, the ability for another electricity source to cycle down during the day and cycle up at night to balance that out. Same thing when it's windy or not windy, right? And so some of these reactors, like the, um, the natrium reactor, I believe, that, which is the one that's going to be installed in Wyoming, has runs at, uh, gosh, it's 300 something megawatts at normal capacity, but it can store excess heat 
in the form of molten salt storage and, and bring that heat back and utilize that to produce more. So it can ramp up, I think it's to 500 megawatts for something like five or six hours at a time. And so that's, it's very cool. So then these new SMRs are much more viable to be worked into grids alongside renewables. So that's pretty exciting. So the United States is not investing a lot in terms of new builds for large reactors. There's two reactors currently under construction um, that'll probably be online in the next few years, but more of the interest and the money in the States is going towards um, this advanced nuclear. Now, if investors wanted to go long on the uranium sector, how are they typically doing that? Specifically, individual retail investors, are they buying miners or are they buying some sort of uranium trust or how are they going about that? It, you know, a lot of that depends on the individual investor, their, their own net worth, their age, their risk tolerance, et cetera, their goals for that investment. There's high risk investments or low, there's low risk investments within the space, um, within a generally high risk space. So, um, you know, the lowest risk would actually be buying something like the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, which holds physical uranium and roughly tracks the cost of the commodity. So if you're bullish on the commodities price upside, which at this point, um, spot price is about $45 a pound. Uh, the marginal cost of production is probably closer to $65, $70 a pound at this point with inflation and, and supply chain issues that we're seeing globally. So there's about a 2x potential in the commodity to get to that level. Will it overshoot again? Probably. So safely, you're probably looking at a two to three X, maybe a little bit more to invest in this trust. But the downside here from this level is very, very minimal. So risk adjusted, it's probably the safest bet in the space would be owning the commodity. There's also yellow cake, which is based in London. Um, they do this. They also hold physical uranium. Um, I would say the next less uh, risky would be owning a basket of stocks, like just literally owning an ETF. Um, so there's the URA and the URNM ETFs, both trade on the New York Stock Exchange. There's HURA, which trades on the TSX. And there's Geiger Counter, which, chain, uh, which trades in the London Stock Exchange. Um, URNM is the only pure play in the States that owns solely uranium stocks. And they're about to be taken over by Sprott. And the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust is a holding in URNM, is one of URNM's holdings. So that's interesting. Um, that's going to be taken over later next month. And we think that that's going to be um, a, a decent catalyst for the sector. Sprott is a, a marketing machine with a huge, huge reach in the resource sector. Not sure how familiar your audience is with Sprott, but they have, um, what, about 15 billion assets under management in terms of their physical trusts, gold, silver, platinum, palladium, and uranium. And they're just a monster in the space. So they're running this fund, this physical trust, and they're also taking over the largest uh, pure play uranium ETF in, next month. Um, so owning the ETF is just taking the shotgun approach and just, you know, buying a little bit of kind of everything just to have exposure to the sector. And then um, I would say that smaller retail investors like to uh, uh, gamble a little bit more and invest more heavily in the companies they like and the, the really risky miners, you know, the small cap exploration stocks are obviously the most risky um, because you're gambling on whether or not they'll actually hit and make a discovery during the bull market, which is um, unlikely for most companies, but possible. If a small cap explorer hits a big discovery during the bull market, you could see absolutely insane returns, you know, 50, 100x at this point would even be possible for some of the companies that are trading at, you know, 5, 10, 20 million on market caps. Um, most of uh, the exposure for um, for our portfolio is in developers. These are companies that are a little bit de-risked in that they already have um, some proven out assets. They already have a discovery. They're working towards turning that um, asset or multiple assets into actual producing uranium mines. Um, and some of those companies can still see really big upside, but you remove a lot of that risk that you're gambling on. I mean, it's not a drill play necessarily. Um, and then the large caps that are already producing are probably the lowest risk amongst the individual miners. So the Cameco's, the Kazadam Proms, um, <laughs> there's not that many producing companies right now. UR Energy is barely producing. Um, and then some of the other, most of the other producers are private companies. So Arano, which is a French company, they're a huge player in the space. Uranium One, um, CGN is publicly traded. They're a big producer. You can buy them on the Hong Kong exchange. 
Um, but yeah, it's uh, explorers, developers, producers, ETFs, and then the physical commodity trusts. I see this brought uranium trust brought up a lot. Could you talk a little bit more about the role that Sprott plays in their o- over, overall uranium market and the demand for the actual, you know, physical uranium? Yeah, for sure. Um, Sprott took over a vehicle called Uranium Participation Corporation that was established in 2005. And that uh, was established as a physical uranium fund to purchase uranium. And over the course of 2005 until last year, they accumulated 18 million pounds of uranium. And it was established simply as a investment vehicle for investors to have exposure to the commodity without actually having to buy a miner. So if you just want to place a bet on your, because uranium doesn't have a futures market. It's not like you can trade futures like oil and gas or gold and silver, et cetera. Um, so to have exposure to the commodity without buying the actual miners, that's why this was created. And like I said, they accumulated 18 million pounds up until last year. Sprott uh, was working on taking them over for about three years. That's how long they were working on this deal. And then nobody knew about it. I mean, nobody. Um, I have a lot of really connected contacts in the sector and that surprised everybody when we heard about that. They announced it in April of last year. It's like, oh, damn. Okay, this is happening. Um, We knew it was a huge deal. The biggest piece of news to hit the uranium space since I've been following in 2016. So they took it over. They did a couple of things immediately that were really smart. They did, they did uh, an immediate share consolidation, a reverse split to raise the price of the actual stock in order to uh, open it up to more investments. Um, there are some institutions that can't touch a stock if it's under $3, for example, or whatever the price might be. And so just doing a reverse split raised the price, uh, lowered the number of outstanding shares, no brainer. Immediately that opened them up to other investors that couldn't touch it before. I don't know why UPC never did that. The second thing they did, which is more important, was they establish an at-the-market financing vehicle, uh, also known as ATM. What that allows is uh, it allows them to issue shares into the open market at will. So most of the time when a company in the resource space um, raises money, they do so through a, through a private placement or, or a broker deal where they, actual, they actually issue shares and oftentimes warrants to individual investors or institutions in exchange for, for cash. Um, and in this way, Sprott can just issue shares into the open market at any given time. And of course, they're only doing that when they're at a 1% premium to the net asset value. So you take the total value of all the uranium they're holding plus their cash um, and, and, and measure that relative against the price of the stock, essentially, is what they're doing. And they get a 1% management fee whenever they buy uranium. So they, they at least have a 1% premium. So now they're issuing shares in the market up to 50, 60% of total trading volume on any given day if they're at that premium to NAV. And they've got, they've already done over a billion dollars since August through this ATM. They have up to three and a half billion already allocated. Uh, they very likely are have raised, well, there's still two hours left in the day. Um, I, think, I think they're going to be north of 100 million raised today. Uh, today, we saw actual record trading volume in that trust. So um, it's really important to understand that the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust is a buy-only trust. They are not trading uranium. The uranium that they purchase, they will hold forever. So they're essentially an end user of uranium that's driven by the financials, that's driven by the financial interests. So you can, when they're trading at a premium to NAV, if you go and buy shares, half of the shares that you're buying in the open market, you're buying them directly from Sprott and they're raising money by issuing those shares to buy physical uranium in the spot market. And the spot market is, is any uranium trade that happens with um, less than 12 months delivery or less than 12 months um, to, to close that, that deal. So um, when they're buying in the market, they're buying in short time frames. They're, they're wanting delivery within a month or two. And that's why you see such dramatic changes in the price when Sprott is actually in the market. Very interesting. Now, when I was doing my research on the uranium market, I was reading that the nuclear reactors over the past few years have been buying less uranium than they actually use, which means whatever reserves they have are slowly being depleted. Why haven't the nuclear reactors been buying more than they consume while 
the uranium prices are relatively low. Surely they know the market as well as anyone. This is the classic question uh, for anybody that, that comes to the space is like, well, the prices are lower than the average cost of production. So why aren't they just loading the boat now? Um, you know, the, the environment of that oversupply of the last decade really created this, um, I don't want to say false sense of security because it really was a real sense of security for the utilities. They could, they could go at any given time out of the market um, and buy from whether it was Kazatom Prom or Uranium One that was producing really cheaply out of Kazakhstan or from something uh, called a carry trader. A carry trader is essentially a trader that would um, sign a contract, a delivery contract with the utility and then they would go out and source the pounds from the spot market. They would carry it on their books. They would add their cost of capital, add their storage costs for holding the uranium at whatever facility they're holding it at, and add their own little bit of profit in there. And the, and the utilities could buy these carry trade pounds so easily, so abundantly, and so cheaply for so long that there wasn't, th th there's no real incentive for a fuel buyer at a nuclear utility to take the risk and voluntarily come forward and say, okay, hey, Cameco, uh, I know you want $45 a pound to open MacArthur River back up, but I can just go to this carry trade right here for 28 bucks a pound, so I'm not going to do that. And it hurt the producers for a very long time. Um, why didn't they load their inventories? Because they've had this abundant, abundant uranium available for as long as they can remember, essentially. Um, the, the European utilities are a bit more covered. They, they have to hold a minimum of three years inventory. The United States uh, utilities are closer to around that two-year mark. So historically, a little bit on the low side. But it's not like the utilities are in dire straits yet. They, they just aren't. The story that's happening now is uh, based on looking at the mid to long-term market. So let's say 2025 to 2030 and beyond for utilities. And then looking at the immediate situation with an extremely thin spot market and uh, potentially massive financial demand. And I just realized I didn't ask part of your previous question, which so Sprott purchased um, a 23, I think it's 23 and a half million pounds. Um, and they did that in less than four months of last year. So they purchased more in four months than uh, uranium participation purchased in uh, 15 years. Yeah. Hey everyone, Clay Fink here, host of the Millennial Investing Podcast. Today, I wanted to tell you guys about this exciting new investment tool called Titan. Titan is an investment platform that was made for everyday investors that want their money actively managed by a team of experienced analysts. With how hectic life can get at times, why not outsource your investments to the experts? They offer three equity portfolios and America's very first actively managed crypto portfolio. Since launching each portfolio, Titan has outperformed the benchmark in three of their four portfolios on an after-fee basis. They aim to grow your investments by 15% annually, and at this rate of growth, this implies your money doubling every five years. My favorite fund is their flagship fund, which invests in the highest quality large-cap growth stocks in the U.S. Join the smarter way to invest with Titan. All it takes is $100 to get started. Right now, if you sign up through our link, titan.com slash TIP, You'll get your first three months of investment management for zero fees. That's titan.com slash TIP for zero fees. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's insane. There's been a lot of talk about nuclear being a reliable, clean energy source. And you mentioned this earlier. And I'm definitely no expert on green energy. I'm curious, what has kept the nuclear energy sector from becoming a primary source of energy in the U.S.? or in de other developed countries and how might that change in the future? Sure. Well, I mean, it, it still is a really important and primary source of energy in the U S it's still, it's about 20% of the grid here. Um, and that's based on the, the massive build outs that were done in the seventies and eighties. The, the pace of build outs substantially slowed nineties um, and two thousands in the United States. And the primary reason for that has to do with cost. So it's so much faster and so much cheaper to build a coal plant or a natural gas plant, or even to establish a field of solar panels and put up a wind farm, whatever it might be. So it's cost, it's regulation. Um, in the United States, there's massive, massive bureaucratic red tape. Um, you're dealing with uh, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of union workers 
Um, it's just very, very expensive. Where a country like China is building uh, these reactors called the Wallong reactors, and these reactors are they can just do one after the other, exact same design, um, just cut through. You know, the red tape there is just so so much less than what we what we have here. So. Um, that's what's kept it from happening primarily in the United States. There's also been a decent amount of negative sentiment that's been built up in the West in general. And a lot of that has to do with not only with Fukushima or in the States prior to that would be a three mile Island, which actually that was a meltdown, but it was contained and actually didn't even spew radiation or hurt anybody. Uh, neither did Fukushima, by the way, there's zero deaths from Fukushima. Um, a lot of deaths, unfortunately, from the evacuation. And from the tsunami, of course, but that that meltdown at Fukushima had no uh, deaths associated with it. Most people don't know that. Um, but there's also been a concerted campaign from the fossil fuel companies to um, give nuclear a bad name. And the reason is whenever a nuclear plant shuts down, fossil fuel picks up the pieces for the reasons I already described with renewables. Renewables are kind of the hot item and have been for the past decade. Everybody thinks, you know, thinks it's like the next step to... To, to world peace and whatever it might be in, in a, a carbon free future and renewables have their place, but um, we've seen what's happened in Germany, for example, they've put $500 billion with a B into solar and wind uh, in their program called energy Vende. And what that has done is they shut down half the nuclear plants. They just shut down three more last week, by the way. Um, and they went all out into wind and solar. And so 50% of their energy grid is wind and solar. Um, what happened because of their shutdown of nuclear and because of their massive expansion into intermittent energy sources is they've had to build more coal plants in order to buffer that intermittency in the grid and stabilize the grid. So they have some of the worst air quality in Europe. They have some of the highest energy prices in Europe. And um, it's, been, uh, it's been an energy nightmare for, for the Germans, really. Um, and it, it's just insane that they're closing down their last nuclear reactors. <laughs> It's just totally crazy. Um, so that's that's kind of the long-winded answer to say that sentiment has been poor. There's there's concern over uh, nuclear waste for, from people that don't understand it very well. Um, nuclear waste, really, there isn't a great solution for it still. There's no uh, agreed-upon location in the United States where to, where to store it. Other countries have figured out um, some pretty ingenious storage situations like Finland. You have this series of underground tunnels that go deep underground. And the, the waste is already held in a, in, a, in a large cask with very thick walls of, of concrete and steel. And then that cask is brought underground and it's buried in clay and then cemented over. And it's, you know, however many, you know, hundreds of meters underground. So it's, you know, it stays radioactive for a very long time, but, um, but it's stored safely. It's literally the only, uh, you know, energy, energy, it's the only waste product from an energy source that's extremely highly regulated. So if you imagine the waste product from a natural gas plant is in your lungs and in my lungs and in the ocean and from the coal plant, same thing. More people die in a single day from coal production, from coal energy production than have died in the history of nuclear. So it's actually the safest form of energy that's ever been produced. It's safer than solar. In terms of deaths per kilowatt hour produced, it's safer than everything. I'm curious, nuclear reactors in the US, what do they currently do with all of the waste? And it's stored at each individual facility, at each power plant, mm -hmm. in, in these casks. And to your point about Germany, has there been any pushback from the people or from politicians to try and turn on these reactors again, to try and you know, bring the cost of energy back down? There's definitely been a, been a positive shift in, in sentiment amongst the populace. Um, it's been di very difficult the, uh, for, for politicians to reverse course. And that, you know, that's not just Germany, that's anywhere. Politicians don't seem to be able to apologize or say that they were wrong. Um, that's pretty much an impossibility. The incoming chancellor seems to be indifferent about nuclear rather than anti. It was Angela Merkel's decision to close down the reactors after Fukushima and to phase out nuclear, which the populace at the time was fully in support or mostly in support. And now with this energy crisis and the fact that they're so beholden to Russia's natural gas imports and Russia is like, you know, it's got their hand on the tap, like doing this, 
letting a little bit in, a little bit less, a little bit more, just total, total control. Um, and so the, I, the people in Germany are less pleased with the phase out than they were in the past. And there's certainly been a movement to try to save the remaining. There's three left there are, that are <laughs> three left in the country um, that are set to be turned offline this year. Yeah. For those that are critics of nuclear energy, are there any other drawbacks um, or points that you haven't mentioned yet um, regarding, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's expensive and time consuming to build the plants. That's the biggest drawback in most countries. Um, there's huge, huge sunk costs uh, to, to get a reactor up and running. Um, once it is up and running, they can run for, you know, I mean, some of the reactors in the States have been given life extensions to 80 years. And some of those reactors are expected to get another extension potentially out to 100 years. So there's been a lot of safety protocols. That was one of the good things about Fukushima is the reactors that did stay online. Most countries that had nuclear power kind of reassessed and and made sure their safety protocols were in place. But I would say that's probably the biggest downside is the sunk cost and the time that it takes. Um, you know, I mean, the nuclear waste is not a great thing. You know, it's not, it's not a bonus, but it's not as harmful as most people think. It's, it's very highly regulated and there hasn't been an accident with the waste. And so, um, you know, there's, I, I'm not one of those people that thinks that, that there's a perfect solution out there. I really don't. I mean, everything is a compromise. And I think that having um, myopia over any particular issue or any particular perceived solution is typically not a good idea. I think that it's not an all or nothing situation. I think that nuclear has its place in an energy grid. And, you know, where's the conversation about energy conservation? That seemed to have disappeared in the last 10 years. It's like everybody's excited about electric vehicles, electric everything that all we're talking about is electrifying the planet. Nobody's talking about energy conservation anymore. I, I literally, I haven't had that conversation in five years with anybody that I've talked to. So if we're not talking about that, then you can't just come out and say, let's electrify everything. Oh, we're all going to die in 10 years because of carbon. Oh, nuclear bad. It's like, you can't have all of those things. You can't have all of those things. You, you have to compromise somewhere. So I think that the downsides to nuclear, all things considered, are acceptable. And I think that it is a very good source of clean and baseload energy that could, um, I mean, shoot, I mean, you could have nuclear desalinating in, in areas that are stricken by drought to reforest, you know, deserted areas. I mean, there's so many, so many huge potential issues that could be, um, helped with the implementation of nuclear and the small modular reactor thing is really exciting. There's dozens of very, very cool uh, designs that are essentially meltdown proof. Some of them are even working on technology to actually recycle the waste. There is some technology currently for waste recycling. The French are doing it a little bit with something called MOX fuel, where they actually take the nuclear waste and recycle. It's very expensive to do. So that's why everybody doesn't do it. But um, yeah, it's, um, you know, it, like everything else, is a compromise. And I think that um, all things considered, it's a, it's a pretty good solution if we're talking about a future where energy is going to be in increasing demand, which it does seem like that's what we're talking about. It's not necessarily what I'm advocating for, but um, that seems to be the situation. So I think it's a good solution with all of that considered. Is it due to the economics of how these nuclear reactors are built? Is that the reason why most of them are state run? Um, well, there's plenty of private nuclear utilities in the States and in a number of other countries as well, but um, a lot of them are state run. And so, uh, yeah, that has a lot to do with it. Plus just the energy security element of it, rather not bringing in um, the, the, the vicissitudes of capitalism to the security of the energy grid, let's say. So that, that can be a problem in the States sometimes if, um, when, when natural gas is really cheap and a reactor is kind of right on the edge of profitability and it has to compete in an energy market in the States that can cause, um, you know, financial problems for some of the utilities. So, yeah. Recently, we've seen some protesting and riots going on in Kazakhstan. Could you expand on how that might affect the global energy markets and the uranium market? 
Sure. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's hard to tell right now because it's so fresh. Um, protests started a few days ago based on uh, the removal of a cap on gasoline prices. The government removed a, a price cap for gasoline and people started to protest. Um, it seemed like the government pretty quickly reversed course and said, okay, okay, we'll put the cap back. And the people are already in protest mode and they're they're full on rioting. Um, they, it seems like they're trying to overthrow the government at this point. Uh, the, the president of Kazakhstan has already basically canned his entire cabinet and is saying, yeah, I'm not going anywhere. And, um, and we're going to do everything we can to quell these protests. They've shut off the internet across the entire country, which um, seems like a just, I was reading an article about it today. And, and that was just kind of like a passing line. Oh, there's been a nationwide internet shutdown. And I thought about that for a second. Like, imagine that here. Like, that's a really, really debilitating, like huge deal. And I don't know how long that's going to last. I mean, that affects people's survival at this point, right? So it's, it looks pretty unstable. Um, the rioters have captured the airport, the international airport. Um, they've been, they've burned down government buildings and it doesn't look good. And so uh, the Kremlin out of Russia is already basically saying, like warning other countries to stay out. Don't, don't come in and try to fix this situation. Um, so I think, you know, cause Adam problem, which is the, it's majority state owned, but it's 25% publicly traded now. Um, it lists on the London stock exchange under the ticker KAP. They're the biggest producer in the world. About half of their production goes to China. They have, um, joint ventures with a number of other companies and they're a huge player in the space and they've been a reliable producer for almost two decades. I don't really see yet that this will necessarily impact supplies. I don't think that they will ever default on their delivery uh, requirements and their delivery contracts. That's highly unlikely to happen. But I think what it's doing currently is it's just highlighting the risks of having such a reliance on a single source for something so crucial as uranium for energy. And so utilities that have relied upon this one source because they produce like over 40% of the global uranium production on an annual basis, it's just huge. Um, so any interruption that might come to that even short term is a big deal to the market. So I think that that's what the market's reacting to today in some ways. And I think more than a reaction to that is that was kind of the trigger for money that was on the sidelines to come back in uranium because we had a, about a 30% pullback over the you know, mid-November through the end of the year. So there's a lot, of, a lot of kind of late retail money got washed out and there's a lot of institutional money that's like fresh in January. All right, we've got our new, the whole year ahead of us. We're ready to allocate into this thing. Then this comes along. It's kind of that trigger. Could you talk more about the cyclicality of uranium and where we might be at today and potentially when this uranium bull market started, um, the current one we're in? Sure. Um, it is typically a very cyclical commodity. I mean, all, com all commodities really are cyclical. They go through those boom and bust cycles, uh, like I mentioned, and the commodities that can react faster to a pricing environment are the ones that have smaller uh, cycles usually, which is why the uranium cycles are so huge, right? So like oil and gas wells seemingly can respond faster. Um, gold and silver to some extent, although that's a highly manipulated market, um, but these commodities markets where you have um, a very, very slow time frame to respond to prices, it, it, you have huge cycles. Okay, So the cycle that went uh, peaked in 2007 at $134 a pound uh, fell, fell pretty sharply from there, recovered and was starting to recover in then Fukushima in 2011. Then it fell practically in a straight line from about $70 a pound down to $18 a pound in 2016. So the commodity bottom was 2016, late 2016 at $18 a pound. The equities bottom was March, 2020. So when we had just kind of the COVID crash is when the equities bottom, most equities bottomed then. Some of the equities bottomed with the commodity. Some of the, the stronger companies, I would say, kind of bottomed with the commodity and recovered with the commodity. Um, and held up better um, in that March 2020 crash, but that was roughly the equities bottom. We had a pretty decent recovery in the equities from March 2020 for about a six month period after that. And then it kind of leveled off. The spot price stopped moving. The spot price really was moving because Cameco was buying in the market on short delivery because they had to shut their Cigar Lake mine. 
And so when they close that mine, they started buying in the market. So not only do you have pounds not coming into the market because the mine was closed, but they were coming out of the market faster because this producer became a buyer in a greater capacity than they already were. So the spot price moved pretty sharply, March 2020 for a few months, equities moved pretty sharply. Sentiment was there, but it was kind of like, oh, maybe this is just a COVID thing. Uh, who knows when the market's going to move again. Then December of last, uh, not last year, 2020, so 13 months ago, huge volumes came into the space seemingly out of nowhere. And we had um, a prominent newsletter writer, Larry McDonald, Larry McDonald, he writes something called the Bear Traps Report, goes out to a pretty large institutional uh, membership. He did an article on uranium citing uh, this, this commodity that's unloved and the equities are way undervalued and it's an energy play. And uh, we believe that it's going to be increasingly accepted as green energy, therefore ESG funds, environmental social governance funds, like actual um, investment funds that can only invest in companies that, are, that fall into that category of, of responsible uh, management, let's say, in, in one of those ways. So part of the thesis was uranium would eventually be in the ESG play. So a lot of money came in in December 2020. Um, spot price didn't really move then. It moved up maybe a couple of dollars, but the equities went on a moonshot from December to about June. Um, and part of that was the April news of last year of spot taking over UPC. So as soon as that happened, then that was kind of this sequestering of above ground mobile inventory in the spot market, which we believe Sprott has worked through most of whatever was remaining from the previous decades oversupply. So that's a long-winded answer to say that we're not at the very bottom. Um, we're probably in maybe the third inning, probably the second or third inning here. If you look at a chart of the previous run, you can really see, and this is the, this is the case in most bull markets for most commodities or most stocks even, is that the really euphoric moves happen in like the eighth and the ninth inning. And so um, what we know, we know uranium has to go to the marginal cost of production because there's a severe supply shortage, 2025, 2030 and beyond. And I know it's like, well, that's four years away. No, that's, that's like tomorrow in the uranium world. These mines take forever to come online. So this stuff has to happen now. The prices need to move soon to incentivize these projects to avoid a serious supply situation five plus years out. So we know the price has to go at least to that $70, $80 pound mark. We know that the spot market essentially now has been effectively cornered by the financials. And what are the financials going to do? Like they, they know they've got the market, you know, cornered. They know that money going into the Sprott physical uranium trust physically moves the price of the commodity, which therefore moves the equities. So what do we do? What do they do? Buy a big chunk of the ETF and come in and buy a big chunk of the physical trust and rinse and repeat. And so I think that um, things look extremely bright and that's part of the cyclicality. Typically there's some annual cycl cyclicality, like a seasonal element to uranium as well. It doesn't play out every year. It's sort of played out this year. We had a strong October and first half of November, then it pulled back and erased a lot of those gains. Now it's running again. So typically we have about um, early to mid October through about February is usually a strong season for uranium most years. And that's obviously an average that goes back in you know, the last 20 years, but it's not something you can set your watch to, but the overall cycle is, um, really boom and bust and, and the bust destroys most companies and takes way longer than it should and the boom goes way way higher and oftentimes way faster than it should so the price doesn't need to go to 150 200 a pound but it very well could because it's not being driven by a, a, a fast moving supply uh deficit responsive market it's being driven by financial players yeah, like many markets, it overshoots to the upside and undershoots to the downside. I mean, we talk about that with the stock market all the time, which is something our show is really focused on. Now, due to the cyclicality of uranium, I'm assuming that at some point you'll either sell or trim your position. What are some of the telltale signs you'll be looking for when it's time to potentially take money off the table? For sure, yeah. It's not something you want to just close your eyes for 10 years on. 
it's not it's not a a blue chip dividend paying stock that you want to you know give to your grandchild it's like it's something you're going to want to get out at some point so um and likely because of that overshoot so some of those signs would be any entity that is purchased physically uranium that's not sprot because they're a buy and hold fund trust um sells uranium back into the market so um, there's other hedge funds that have purchased uranium there's uh, producers and developers that have purchased uranium that are just holding physical uranium. So if we see some of those entities start to sell pounds in the market, that's one sign that they think that maybe it's nearing a peak. That was a big sign in the previous market um, because UPC and some of these other hedge funds that were that were selling that were holding uranium did sell back in the market, and it was it was more of a visible thing. That's going to be a harder thing to watch this market. Um, one of the other signs would be a very sharp and prolonged overshoot of the spot price above the term price. But typically the long-term price is higher than the spot price because of the cost of the future unknowns between the time the contract is signed and the uranium is delivered. Now, um, so what is the term price? The term price is, well, it's technically the, the, the official price of uranium for a, a time period of delivery beyond 12 months, but you have, you know, the price reporters, the, um, uh, uranium uh, consultants will report on the price and they'll actually have like a midterm and a long-term term price. But there's more of an official term price, which is $43 a pound, which right now is lower by $2 than the spot price as of today. So, but typically the term price is, is more expensive than the spot price because you have interest rates and you have um, potential unknowns between the time that that contract is signed and the uranium delivered. So, um, in a, in a roaring bull market, typically what happens is the spot price will kind of, you know, do this and cross above the term price and then run. Um, so if and when it does that and it gets really overshot, like if we have a term price at $75 a pound and the spot price at 150, that's pretty unsustainable and likely to reverse, um, not necessarily tomorrow, but it's something to keep your eye on. Um, so seeing that overshoot is definitely going to be a signal to kind of at least, at least be eyeing the exit door. Um, and then of course, you know, just kind of the classic technical analysis, watching volumes, watching moving averages, watching large volume selling in the ETFs and the large cap companies would be a sign of institutions bailing out. So that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, most of the corrections we've seen, at least in the past year, year and a half have been increasing volume on the way up, decreasing volume on the way down, which is very typical bull market activity. So when that reverses, when you see a sell-off of high volume and the dead cat bounce or the recovery in low volume, that doesn't bode well. So just things like that are really what we're looking for. And then of course, there's clues that we watch out for based on our connections in the industry and what we're hearing that are harder to just kind of decipher and see out into the future at this point, but there's always whispers of, of goings on. So that's, we try to stay plugged into that. And of course, you know, keep our, our membership up to date with whatever we're hearing on the front. Could you talk about how you think about the macro economy in relation to your uranium trade and maybe touch on what the uranium market looked like in the March, 2020 inflationary shock we saw? Well, I think in that particular shock, you know, uh, everything, it was a liquidity crisis. So everything, everything got whacked. But that was a, a very unique, unknown situation that was driven by um, mainstream media, just fear mongering, like a level that nobody's ever seen. Um, so I think that that was a unique shock in that nothing is safe in a, in a true liquidity crisis. Um, I think that a lot of lessons were learned in that particular market. I think that um, one of those lessons is the, um, the willingness of the Fed to do just about anything to support the broad market. Um, I think that it's, uh, it showed the resiliency of the markets in general, and that even something as scary and as shocking as that particular crash was, it was the ultimate buy the dip situation. You have negative oil prices, you had silver down under $10 an ounce, uh, God, I mean, it was, that was the buy everything moment of my adult life, uh, I would say. And so I think that 
that was the lesson learned there was that the, the, the Fed will basically do anything to keep things propped up at this point. They're talking about interest rate raises. You know, I don't think they can raise rates very much before drastically affecting the market. So they're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. We have, you know, certain analysts, pundits talking about a 60 to 80% crash coming. I just like, the only way I see something like that happening is if there's an absolute unforeseen, like if nuclear war is coming or something like that, God forbid. That's, but that's something that you can't predict. And it's something you can't really prepare for. Like, how do you hedge for a market crash in a market that doesn't stop going up? It's like, you're going to just keep buying puts. Okay. Go out and try to buy a, a three-year long dated put on the S&P right now. The premiums are absolutely astronomical. And you're going to have to take a huge chunk of your portfolio and risk that position in order for it to pay off if things do turn. So in my opinion, the best hedge for a broad market situation is cash. Um, I think that it's a fool's game to continue to short the market. You know, people have been con- you know, calling the top in the S&P for the last five years. It's like, it's just a pointless conversation. I think that if you have a good run in your investments and you're way, way, way up and you think something is looming, just take some off the table and sit in certain percentage of cash. That's what we plan to do. Um, as far as the uranium market goes, I think that uh, we should, should see a good leg here in the short term, judging by the volumes we're seeing today and, and the recovery coming off of a 30% decline and you know, the market's ready for another run. Um, I think that there's a couple of catalysts, one being Sprott taking over URNM in February and Sprott likely getting a New York Stock Exchange listing for the Physical Uranium Trust, which will most likely be a Q3 story. So we should see a generally positive situation between now and then, and we could see really violent upside moves once that does happen with the, with the NYSE listing, because then it just opens up. It's, the market is 13 times bigger than the TSX that they're on now. Um, and who knows if they get an options market or not. It's like, it could get really wild. So um, the one, if we have the time to get into it, not really... I'll be quick at this. You can go um, uh, Take your time. Yeah. The one thing that I think is interesting um, that will probably buffer a astronomical move in the uranium prices in the short-ish term is we have this situation that kind of developed in August, September of last year when we had um, a pretty severely backwardated market with the spot price substantially higher, 15, 20% higher than the term price for a minute there. We had a term price at 35 we had a spot price of 50, right? And that lasted for a couple of weeks, <clears throat> maybe maybe less than a week or above 50, but still severely backwardated for a few weeks. So what we had was a number of carry traders who were holding physical pounds for future delivery for a contract they signed with the utility, right? So they're, they're holding these pounds. And let's say they had to promise those pounds for delivery for 2023, for example. What they could do in the meantime is secure a contract, a midterm contract, for 2023 delivery, a month before they were supposed to deliver their pounds to the utility with a producer at a long-term price of $35 a pound and sell the pounds they're sitting on the spot for 50. And so we have a certain amount of pounds that are being held in carry currently that will likely free up and add some liquidity to the spot market if we are in a severely backwardated market again. So if we see a bunch of money come into the Sprout Physical Green Trust right now and push the price back up above 50, which I think we'll see probably in the next week or two, then what we'll probably see is some more liquidity come from these carried pounds. So that's going to keep the price from moonshotting to $80 a pound. It's not like an, uh, an, an endless amount of funds can come into this vehicle and move the price in a straight line up. That's not how it's going to work. There's going to be periods of liquidity. So the first period of liquidity is going to come from the carry traders in this reverse carry trade, selling their carried pounds into the spot market to spot, cashing out, securing a midterm contract for a lower price. It's a no-brainer trade for them. So how much pounds are held in carry? That's the question, right? Well, we think that there's probably somewhere in the realm of maybe 20, 25 million pounds held in carry. All of that is not going to clear out. It really has to do with the level of backwardation to justify that type of trade happening. But that is going to buffer things in the short term. Sprott's already purchased that amount of uranium. So how long will that buffer it? I don't know. But it's going to keep it from going from 45 to 90, in my opinion. 
I could be wrong, of course, but that's my opinion. So we should see a generally positive market with a generally rising spot uranium price. And if it goes in the way that I think it will with some liquidity coming from this reverse carry trade, then we should see spot continue to rise slowly, bring the term price up. Possibly it, it, it chills for a minute before this New York Stock Exchange listing. When that is confirmed, then I think we could have a more serious move. Once that liquidity from that from the carried pounds is worked through and the spot market is thin, then there's really no more liquidity to come in at those prices. There's going to be some pounds that come from Japan because of utilities that have closed for good. There's some reactors that are not coming back online in Japan. And some of those utilities are holding pounds on their books that they paid 80 bucks a pound for, 90 bucks a pound for, 70 bucks a pound for 10 years ago. So it's, I think when, when the price gets up to that level again, we'll see some more liquidity come in from there. But it really is a relative consideration to what type of money is coming in the, into the uranium market at the time. So um, long story short, uh, very short-term predictions in this market are a fool's errand. And I try not to do it. And I suggest anybody who's interested in this market, if they, by, by the way, this is still a pretty good time to position considering the pullback. Um, just taking a longer term view, you know, I think that, I think that at the very shortest, we should see probably a two year bull, bull run to an overshoot in the uranium price. And it could go three, four, five years. Um, and it could turn into a, a uranium super cycle. It, it, a lot of different, you know, elements are contingent on that happening. Of course, the broad markets are one of them. But um, I think that we're in for a very exciting, at the very least, you know, two to three years starting now. Yeah, just for reference, today's Wednesday, January 5th. Usually it takes a couple, you know, two or three weeks for the episode to be released, just for everyone that's listening today. Justin, thank you so much for coming onto the show. I have really enjoyed this conversation. And listeners are interested in learning more about the uranium markets. I encourage you to just do your own research and you know, learn from as many sources that you can. And I think Justin is a really good resource to learn from. Before we close out the episode, where can the audience go to connect with you, Justin? Sure. Um, the audience can find me at uraniuminsider.com. I'm on Twitter pretty frequently, um, at Uranium Insider. And um, I also have uh, a daily podcast that I do on YouTube called the Uranium Market Minute. It's um, just kind of geared towards the day-to-day -day movements and the spot price and the and the flows and the spot vehicle and the ETFs and just anything else I want to kind of pontificate on in the uranium markets. But um, yeah, uraniuminsider.com, you can contact me through there if you have any questions. And um, we can also give you a, a sample newsletter if you're interested in checking out the type of content that we put out for our members. Awesome. I'll definitely be sure to link all those in the show notes. Justin, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Clay. It's been fun. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.